This is cassette number two. If in an uncertain world an error must be made, shouldn't it be biased toward protecting customers and the public? And incidentally, what do these cases say about the ability of the free enterprise system to police itself? Aren't these instances where at least some government intrusion is in the public interest? A 1971 internal report of the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Corporation lists as a corporate objective to set aside in the minds of millions the false conviction that cigarette smoking causes lung cancer and other diseases, a conviction based on fanatical assumptions, fallacious rumors, unsupported claims, and the unscientific statements and conjectures of publicity-seeking opportunists. They complain of the incredible, unprecedented, and nefarious attack against the cigarette, constituting the greatest libel and slander ever perpetrated against any product in the history of free enterprise, a criminal libel of such major proportions and implications that one wonders how such a crusade of calumny can be reconciled under the Constitution, can be so flouted and violated. This rhetoric is only slightly more inflamed than what the tobacco industry has from time to time uttered for public consumption. There are many brands of cigarettes that advertise low tar, 10 milligrams or less per cigarette. Why is this a virtue? Because it is the refractory tars in which polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and some other carcinogens are concentrated. Aren't the low tar ads a tacit admission by the tobacco companies that cigarettes indeed cause cancer? Tobacco is addictive, by many criteria more so than heroin and cocaine. There was a reason people would, as the 1940s ad put it, walk a mile for a camel. More people have died of tobacco than in all of World War II. According to the World Health Organization, smoking kills three million people every year worldwide. This will rise to 10 million annual deaths by 2020, in part because of a massive advertising campaign to portray smoking as advanced and fashionable to young women in the developing world. Part of the success of the tobacco industry in purveying this brew of addictive poisons can be attributed to widespread unfamiliarity with baloney detection, critical thinking, and the scientific method. Gullibility kills. At the borders of science, and sometimes as a carryover from pre-scientific thinking, lurks a range of ideas that are appealing, or at least modestly mind-boggling, but that have not been conscientiously worked over with a baloney detection kit at least by their advocates. The notion, say, that the Earth's surface is on the inside, not the outside, of a sphere. Or claims that you can levitate yourself by meditating, and that ballet dancers and basketball players routinely get up so high by levitating. Or the proposition that I have something called a soul, made not of matter or energy, but of something else for which there is no other evidence, and which, after my death, might return to animate a cow or a worm. Typical offerings of pseudoscience and superstition, this is merely a representative, not a comprehensive list, are astrology, the Bermuda Triangle, Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster, ghosts, the evil eye, multicolored halo-like auras said to surround the heads of everyone with colors personalized, extrasensory perception, ESP, such as telepathy, precognition, telekinesis, and remote viewing of distant places, the belief that 13 is an unlucky number, because of which many no-nonsense office buildings and hotels in America pass directly from the 12th to the 14th floors, why take chances, bleeding statues, the conviction that carrying the severed foot of a rabbit around with you brings good luck, divining rods, dousing and water witching, facilitated communication in autism, the belief that razor blades stay sharper when kept inside small cardboard pyramids and other tenets of pyramidology, phone calls, none of them collect, from the dead, the prophecies of Nostradamus, the alleged discovery that untrained flatworms can learn the task by eating the ground-up remains of other, better educated flatworms, the notion that more crimes are committed when the moon is full, palmistry, numerology, polygraphy, comets, tea leaves and monstrous births as prodigies of future events, plus the divinations fashionable in earlier epochs accomplished by viewing entrails, smoke, the shapes of flames, shadows and excrement, listening to gurgling stomachs, and even, for a brief period, examining tables of logarithms, photography of past events, such as the crucifixion of Jesus, a Russian elephant that speaks fluently, sensitives who, when carelessly blindfolded, read books with their fingertips, Edgar Cayce, who predicted that in the 1960s the lost continent of Atlantis would rise, and other prophets sleeping and awake, diet quackery, 
out-of-body, e.g. near-death, experiences interpreted as real events in the external world. Faith healer fraud, Ouija boards, the emotional lies of geraniums uncovered by intrepid use of a lie detector, water remembering what molecules used to be dissolved in it, telling character from facial features or bumps on the head, the hundredth monkey confusion, and other claims that whatever a small fraction of us wants to be true really is true. Human beings spontaneously bursting into flame and being burned to a crisp. Three-cycle biorhythms, perpetual motion machines, promising unlimited supplies of energy, but all of which, for one reason or another, are withheld from close examination by skeptics. The systematically inept predictions of Gene Dixon, who predicted a 1953 Soviet invasion of Iran, and in 1965 that the USSR would beat the US to put the first human on the moon, and other professional psychics the Jehovah's Witness prediction that the world would end in 1917, and many similar prophecies, Dianetics and Scientology, Carlos Castaneda and sorcery, claims of finding the remains of Noah's Ark, the Amityville horror and other hauntings, and accounts of a small brontosaurus crashing through the rainforests of the Congo Republic in our time. Some claims are hard to test. For example, if an expedition fails to find the ghost or the brontosaurus, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Others are easier, for example, flatworm cannibalistic learning, or the announcement that colonies of bacteria subjected to an antibiotic on an agar dish thrive when their prosperity is prayed for, compared to control bacteria unredeemed by prayer. A few, for example, perpetual motion machines, can be excluded on grounds of fundamental physics. Except for them, it's not that we know before examining the evidence that the notions are false. Stranger things are routinely incorporated into the corpus of science. The question, as always, is how good is the evidence? The burden of proof surely rests on the shoulders of those who advance such claims. Revealingly, some proponents hold that skepticism is a liability, that true science is inquiry without skepticism. They are perhaps halfway there, but halfway doesn't do it. Parapsychologist Susan Blackmore describes one of the steps in her transformation to a more sceptical attitude on psychic phenomena. A mother and daughter from Scotland asserted they could pick up images from each other's minds. They chose to use playing cards for the tests because that is what they used at home. I let them choose the room in which they would be tested and ensured that there was no normal way for the receiver to see the cards. They failed. They could not get more right than chance predicted and they were terribly disappointed. They had honestly believed they could do it, and I began to see how easy it is to be fooled by your own desire to believe. I had similar experiences with several dowsers, children who claimed they could move objects psychokinetically, and several who said they had telepathic powers. They all failed. Even now I have a five-digit number, a word, and a small object in my kitchen at home. The place and items were chosen by a young man who intends to see them while traveling out of his body. They have been there, though regularly changed, for three years. So far, though, he has had no success. Telepathy literally means to feel at a distance, just as telephone is to hear at a distance and television is to see at a distance. The word suggests the communication not of thoughts, but of feelings, emotions. Around a quarter of all Americans believe they've experienced something like telepathy. People who know each other very well, who live together, who are practiced in one another's feeling tones, associations and thinking styles, can often anticipate what the partner will say. This is merely the usual five senses plus human empathy, sensitivity and intelligence in operation. It may feel extrasensory, but it's not at all what's intended by the word telepathy. If something like this were ever conclusively demonstrated, it would, I think, have discernible physical causes, perhaps electrical currents in the brain. Pseudoscience, rightly or wrongly labelled, is by no means the same thing as the supernatural, which is, by definition, something somehow outside of nature. It is barely possible that a few of these paranormal claims might one day be verified by solid scientific data, but it would be foolish to accept any of them without adequate evidence. When conventional medicine fails, when we must confront pain and death, of course we are open to other prospects for hope. And after all, some illnesses are psychogenic. Many can be at least ameliorated by a positive cast of mind. Placebos are dummy drugs, often sugar pills. Drug companies routinely compare the effectiveness of their drugs against placebos given to patients with the same disease who had no way to tell the difference between the drug and the placebo. Placebos can be astonishingly effective, 
especially for colds, anxiety, depression, 